So by way of introduction, uh, there is a misconception in the Bible that, that it teaches that women are somehow lesser than men. Uh, and you'll come across atheists and, and feminists and, and angry you know, LGBTQ alphabet people that want to paint, paint the Bible in that kind of picture, that want to paint God's character in that kind of light. Um, and they want to make it seem as if God considers women to be less, lesser than men. And there could be nothing further from the truth. Uh, today we're going to focus on the book of Ruth. And there's two books in the Bible that actually are named after a woman, believe it or not. One's Ruth. Who knows the other one? I got different. Jude is not a woman's oh, name. Okay. Esther. Esther. And you know something interesting about the, those two women is one is a, I'm going to spoil my sermon a little bit, but one is a picture of the body of Christ, a Gentile woman, and the other is a picture of of God, the Father's wife, Israel, Esther, a Jewish woman, a Jewish queen. And uh, we're going to be focusing on Ruth, Ruth. And we're going to be debunking this whole idea that the Bible is against women. That's just completely not true. Uh, the Bible says, and we're gonna, we'll go to this verse again later, but that a, the value of a, of, a, of a virtuous woman is far above rubies. You know, there, a woman who has virtue instilled in her is, is valuable. In fact, there's probably almost very few things in this world that's more valuable than that. I mean, it's commonly been said, and I don't necessarily agree with it doctrinally, but uh, it's important to realize that behind most good men are a good woman. Now, today I'd like to preach to you about this virtuous woman named Ruth. And the title of my sermon is Ruth, a Virtuous Woman. Now, Ruth, Ruth, uh, uh, this woman named Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, you're going to find about their story, about their relationship. And uh, you're going to see just what the Lord did with, with a faithful woman and, uh, and a mother-in-law who lost everything. So raise your hand if you know the story of Ruth. Raise your hand if you know about Ruth. Okay, good. You know, maybe you know generally about him, maybe you don't, or about her, maybe you don't know much. Well, we're going to go through the whole book, all 45 chapters of them. No, I'm just saying there are four chapters, four chapters. But we're going to go through this whole book, so I'm going to kind of speed through parts of it. But just so you can understand the backdrop behind this, behind this uh, story, this, and this is true, by the way, is uh, this is a book in the Old Testament, and this was at, during the time of the judges. Now, before there were kings in Israel, you know, before there was David and Saul, and before all the, that line from 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, before that, there wasn't a... There wasn't a physical king. There was what we call, they call the Bible calls judges at the time. Okay? And uh, just turn one page back. I want, you to see, I want you to see that this was a very bad time. Okay? In the history of Israel. First, uh, go to Judges chapter 21. It's just the next page over. One page behind. Verse 25. The Bible says... Mm, let me see. I'll start from verse 24. No, verse 25, the Bible says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Okay, this was not a good time period. I mean, who's read through the book of Judges? Do you recall Judges chapter 19? Judges 19 with the, with the woman that was uh, cut up into little pieces and mailed around the country? Who knows what I'm talking about? You think I'll jo I'm joking. That, that's in the Bible. It was in a good time to be a woman. I'll tell you that right now. And this was a time where it was pretty much whoever did what people did, whatever they wanted to do, whenever they wanted to do, and whatever was right was in their own eyes. There was no, there was no uh, uh, following the law. There was no, you know, people just did what they pleased. And that's time very similar to now where like might is right. Whoever does, we do whatever we want and we want to justify it and say it's right in our own eyes. Don't, don't, don't negate my truth because that's what I think is true. You do what you want and I'm going to do what I want. Isn't that what we do today? Isn't that what our, our lifestyle is now? We want to justify sinful living and say, you know what? That's just my truth. That's just what I believe. And, you know, to each his own. And, you know, that's the doctrine straight from the devil. It's to say that truth is relative, that right and wrong is just in the eyes of the beholder. But no, the Bible says in the book of Judges that in those days there was no king. You know, no one really cared about God. You know, God was their king, literally. But in their days, no one ruled over them. God just 
You know, he would raise up a judge and he would deliver them and then they'd fall into apostasy and then they would, eventually they would repent and then God would raise up a judge and it would take that cycle over and over again. But they would just do what was right in their own eyes. And this is the time frame in which Ruth came to be. And I want to bring this up because you would think that in, the, in Ruth's time that there would be no virtuous people around, that truth had just evacuated and left like no one's doing anything for God anymore. But that's just not true. I mean, don't we have that now today where people are trying to do something for God despite everyone else living in apostasy? We still have Bible believers that want to do what the Bible says, that want to live life as God told them to, to and not man. See, it, it's important to realize that when we live in times like this, it's important to be a Ruth. It's important to be uh, uh, that virtuous person. So now, going on to uh, my first point, okay? So I'm going to read uh, chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. All right, so now there's a man that's leaving Bethlehem. That's, that's, that's where the Jews are, okay? Bethlehem, Judah. Now, this place is going through a famine right now, and they're sojourning. You, raise your hand if you know what that word sojourn means. It's like a temporary uh, migration. Like we're going somewhere else for a while, and then we're coming back. It's supposed to be temporary. Verse 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his sons, Malon and Chilion, uh, Ephrathites, of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. 10 years. That doesn't sound like a temporary migration. And Malon and Chilion died, and also both of them. And the woman was left, the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So, my first point is that we have a battle between famine, family, and flesh. All right? You see, there was a famine in the land, and... The thing about famine is it, we don't have to deal with this in America, okay? So this might be hard to wrap your head around. Uh, you, you might one day open up in the morning your fridge and you'll, you won't see food in it. That's not famine, all right? Why? I'll just go to the grocery store and get some more food. Or I'll just, you know, go to Jack in a Box and get a dollar. Are they a dollar anymore tacos? Maybe two dollar tacos? A dollar twenty, man. These are apostate times, brother. <laughs> but we, we, we've never experienced famine, Right? Famine is when you go to the grocery store and there's a line out the door just for someone to get one, one little stale piece of bread. All right, there is no food. And our flesh will just cry out to us, you got to feed me, feed me. You know, the, Be the name Bethlehem means house of bread. You know, the, place, the name Judah means praise to God. So Bethlehem Judah is the house of bread and praise of God. Okay. And they left that. They left that to sojourn in Moab. Now Moab was, uh, just some background, Moab was, a, was the, one of the sons of Lot who had an incestuous relationship with, with his daughters when he was drunk. That Bible, it's in the Bible. I'm not making this up. And Moab in the Bible is, is God doesn't want them, the Jews associating with Moabites. But they went. You know why they left the house of praise and, and the house of bread? It's because they would rather please their flesh and feed their bodies than wait on God and, and, and feed their spirit, their souls. You know, the Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But they're leaving the house of bread, the house of praise of God, and they're trying to go please their flesh. You know, they, they couldn't just go to McDonald's and get some Big Macs. You know, they, they were, they were going to starve, at least they thought. And, you know, that's, that sounds justifiable, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound reasonable? Like, well, God doesn't want me to starve to death. I'm just going to go somewhere else. I'm going to leave my church. I'm going to leave my, uh, my neighborhood where God called me to minister and called me to witness. I'm going to leave all that because, hey, man, a, a guy's got to eat. 
You know, and, and that's, that sounds reasonable in your eyes. That sounds justifiable. But you're going to see, I mean, obviously it didn't work out for them. Obviously they made a mistake in leaving God's circle. And they went to Moab. What happened? I mean, would you put yourself in their shoes, by the way? Don't think that, oh man, they made a mistake and then I, I wouldn't make that mistake. You could be very much the same person. I mean, you, would you consider packing up your bags and leaving San Diego just because it's expensive? I mean, most of us already are. Most people are already trying to go to Texas and ruin that state now. Why are we so quick to leave the place God has called us to be? See, how, there's people that are already trying to po uh, point their toes out the church. I don't want to be here anymore. You know, you, they, every church has them. I'm not saying you guys are, you guys are awesome, but uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, but they were already trying to leave, man. They, they wanted to get out of there. They didn't want to go through this, what they thought would be starvation. But you're going to see it was a grave mistake. I mean, listen, if they were trying to go avoid dying, well, they did a great job of that because uh, Elimelech died, her children died, and all she has left are two daughter-in-laws that don't even look like her, they don't talk like her, they don't worship the same God as her. I mean, Naomi, she made a mistake. And notice this, it's not, it's not just Elimelech's fault. Naomi, Naomi the, the mother in this situation, she was the one pushing for this. Notice this, she didn't leave as soon as her, her husband died. Let's go back to the verse. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left of her two, and her two sons. And they took wives of the women of Moab, the name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelled there about ten years. See, they dwelled ten years after Elimelech died. No, Naomi, why don't you just go back home? Unless it was her idea in the first place. Unless she was probably pushing for it. Women, you need to realize that your, your position in the family household has a lot more sway than you, than you notice or you may be even take, given credit for. I mean, they stayed, they left because of Naomi. And Naomi's rash decision to feed her family rather than to feed them spiritually ended in their deaths. I mean, if she was trying to avoid her son dying, her children dying, she did a bad job of that. So she, she went against the faith and she went towards the flesh. And because of that, the famine and her family, uh, the, fa the family died. All because they wanted to avoid uh, the famine, which would have starved their flesh, okay? Now, my next point is the fleshly, the fickle, and the faithful. Verses 6 to 22, then she arose with their daughter and daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So... Now that she hears that, oh man, my, my home country, they're, they're doing pretty good now. I think it's time to move back. She wasn't even thinking about moving back until she heard bread was on the way. You know, she's still focused on the flesh. She was still focused on what pleased the, what, what would please their bodies. But she, they should have never left in the first place. You know, imagine if she didn't just try and please the flesh. Imagine if she didn't just try and feed her family first rather than be fed of God. Maybe none of them would have died. Maybe she would have avoided the tragedy of seeing all three of her, the most important people in her life, just leave and die. Mothers, you need to take note of that. Before you go out to try and please uh, uh, appeal to your, your motherly sense of wisdom, make sure it lines up with the Bible. Make sure it lines up with what the Word of God teaches rather than what you think it should be. And I know, I know this is a Mother's Day service. It sounds like I'm, I'm, I'm going hard on the mothers, but you need to realize how important your role is as a mother. It says here, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. Now these, these two daughter-in-laws, you know, for, you know, for what was going on, they did a pretty good job of being with their, with their mother-in-law. And Naomi, not wanting her daughters-in-law to go through what she's going, she said, you know, you should go back to your home, your home, go back to your mother's. You know, there's nothing here for you anymore. And Naomi blessed them. See, it said here in verse 9, 
The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Now, this is a, t- this is a sad time. I mean, if you're a daughter and, you- and you're mother-in-law, I mean, maybe men, we don't care about our mother-in-laws too much, but that's true, right? <laughs> I'm just joking. I really am, I promise. Um, but, you know, there's a special bond between a mother and her daughter, and Naomi saw these women, and she didn't want them to go through what she was going through. But they, they wept. They wept, and they kissed her. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. They said, No, we're going with you. We won't leave you behind. You know, they, their words said that they were willing to just drop everything and, and be with their, their mother-in-law. And Naomi said, turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? You see, she, she's telling, listen, there's no more husbands coming for you. You know, I don't have any more children you can marry. And you need to realize in this time that marriage was, was far even more important then than it is now. You know, you couldn't just go out and, and, and you know, get your nails done or whatever women like to do. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, you couldn't go out and do the, the work that men do. You couldn't go out and, 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 you know, plow the field. You know, this was harsh labor. And if you got hurt, you know, that's it for you. There was no, a, there was no uh, insurance. There was no uh, days off that you could take. You couldn't just pull on an insurance plan or pull on your, uh, on your 401k or whatever it is that people do now when they have money. Uh, they had very harsh lives. And again, in the time of judges, I mean, listen, it was not uncommon for, and you go to other parts of the country, this is the case too, it was not uncommon for a woman to just, a man to just pull up on a woman and say, all right, you're mine now. That was the case. I mean, it happened with Abraham. Wasn't he scared in Genesis when, when they thought the Pharaoh was gonna take his wife? So he said, just take her, don't kill me. This was a time where people, might was right. And it's not like it is now where you can, you can kind of coast a little bit and be assured that, you know, I, there's a police around that could protect me. You know, there's authorities that we can contact in case, you know. I mean, listen, we, we had a tragedy in, in, in one of our church's families regarding this kind of situation. And you need to realize the reality of life is that people don't always have the best intentions. But Naomi was appealing to them and saying, listen... I'm there, this is a barren path. Don't, try, don't follow me. Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. See, she realizes she, she, realizes she made a mistake. She realizes that, that she, she didn't do what she was supposed to do. And she's telling her daughter-in-laws, don't, don't go the path I've come. You know, I'm not going to be able to give you more children or more sons to marry. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. You know, that means she kissed her. But Ruth clave unto her. And she said, behold, thy sister is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So Orpah left. Orpah took Naomi's advice and said, you know what, you're right. You know, I'm going to go start a life for myself. I hope things work out for you. Now, you know, I mean, this kind of stuff probably happens all the time. And Orpah, she made a fleshly decision. She, she, she heard the words of Naomi and thought, man, you know what, she's right. I want, a, I want a family. I want to start something. I want a, a house. I want, you know, a, a car, two cars in the garage. I want to, you know, I want all this stuff that doesn't really matter. But Ruth saw, saw the light of the situation and said, no, I'm going to cleave unto you. Daughters, you should cleave unto your mothers. You know, don't be so quick to leave the house. Don't be so quick to just uh, go and start your lives now. You know, we live in a time where people want to be empowered and say, you know, I, if I'm not, if I'm stuck at home and with the family, that's a lose situation. You know, there's, there's no merit behind that. I want to go and start my own life and, and, ha, and, and live, uh, make 40,000, 50,000, whatever's a lot of money to you nowadays, make a hundred thousand dollars a year. That doesn't matter. You know, what matters is family. 
Family matters. And don't be so quick to, to just leave like that. You know, Naomi, I'm sorry, Orpa, and that's a weird name, isn't it? Orpa, she, it says she went back to her people and to her gods. You know, she wasn't going to go and worship the God of the Bible. She was going to go and worship her gods. But Ruth clave unto her, and Ruth said in verse 16, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She's saying, you know what, a, who, raise your hand if you know what a ride or die is. You know what a ride or die is? Yeah, you can raise your hand. I know you all know what that is. Ruth was willing to ride or die with Naomi. She said, no, I'm going down with the ship. Uh, she was loyal. She was faithful. She cared about Naomi more than probably most daughters would. You know, if you love your mom and you're a good daughter, amen. But you know, there's daughters out there that, that hate their mothers. And there's mothers out there that hate their daughters. It's true. I know people that, are, that despise their mothers. I know people that, that the word mom is like a cuss word to them. And it's sad to see that. But Ruth loved her mother-in-law. And she's, and the, count them, by the way. She said seven things. One, entreat me not to leave thee. Two, or to return from following after thee. Three, for whither thou goest, I will go. Four, where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Five, thy people shall be my people. Six, and thy God, my God. Seven, where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. She had a submitted will. She was willing to put her interests aside. She was willing to put what she wanted to do in her life. And instead, she was willing to go down that barren path just to, come, just to be with her mother-in-law, Naomi. Do you think God would just look at that and just not even, not even do anything about that kind of situation? It's entirely in God's character to look at something like that and reward it. And we're going to see as the chapter goes on just what happens. So, verse 18, when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they went, they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem, and all the city was moved about them. And they said, and is this Naomi? So she came back. They said, hey, I remember you. You left 10 years ago. Where's your husband? Where's your sons? Who are these women? Imagine that. Having to come back home with your tail between your legs, having to explain the mistake that you made. Verse 19, I'm sorry, verse 20. Then she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara. Mara means bitter. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again, empty. Why then call ye me, call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. So sometimes the Lord has to deal bitterly with you. Why? Because you left fool. You had everything you needed. If you had just stuck at that house of bread and praise, you were fool. Food was on the way. You know, if you had just hold it faithful and fast and true, you wouldn't have to go through the hardships to get back to where you were. Naomi had just wasted 10 years, or so she thought, wasted 10 years because she went out on a, on, a, on a fleshly desire. And you don't ever want to be leaving the house of praise because God might have to deal bitterly with you to get you back. But you want to know something? It wasn't, worth, it, it wasn't a worthless endeavor. All right, God still used it. Why? Because Naomi brought Ruth back with her. You know, she might have left, she might have lost three, uh, a, a husband and two sons, but she came back with a daughter that was, is going to be irreplaceable. Now, verse 22, so Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. All right, so going to ch uh, chapter two, chapter two, there is a chance encounter, all right, a chance encounter. Now, verse two I'm sorry, verse 1, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth, 
of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So there's this man named Boaz, and he's a, he's a wealthy man, you know, he's mighty, and he's a, he, he's a shot caller, so to speak. And he's in the same family as Elimelech, and this is important, as you're going to find out. Verse 2, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. So Naomi is putting it on herself to go and get to work. You know, she wasn't waiting for things to happen. She wasn't just sitting around saying, woe is me, who will, t- who will take care of me? She went out there and, and she got to work. She did something. At least she said she was going to. Verse 3, let's see if she does. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers and her, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging to Bo- Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. So that word hap, it's like happening. It just so happened to be it, the happenstance of it. You know, by chance, she happened upon the field of Boaz. You know, she didn't know who she was going to meet that day, but she just went out to get to work, to do something, to provide when she no one else could provide for her. Women, sometimes you're going to have to be strong. Sometimes you won't always have men to rely on. Sometimes you're going to have to get to work. But God, he, uh, he rewards the faithful. He will look at your happenstances in life. Um, Ruth took it on herself to go and make something happen. She wasn't woeful when they got to Bethlehem. She went out to, a, listen, put yourself in Ruth's shoes, all right? She's a foreigner. She doesn't look like a Jew. She doesn't talk like a Jew. She probably doesn't speak the language very well. And she put it on herself to go and provide and put herself in a situation where she didn't know if she'd be coming home with food or not. But God uses this kind of endeavor, this kind of happening, and guides us down a path that is eventually going to be his will. Go to Proverbs chapter 2. I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 21. You need to realize it's important to find God's will in your life. But sometimes we don't know what that will is. So how does God find, uh, find a way to give, let us know his will? Well, let's go to verse 21 of Proverbs 5. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. So God, he sees all the ways of man. He sees what you're trying to do. He sees what you're trying to make of yourself, and he's pondering them. He's looking at the way, Elijah, I'm looking at how you're doing that, the, the car detailing, and I'm seeing that you're faithful and trying to get the jobs done. I'm going to throw a bone your way. I'm going to give you a job here and there. You know, Orlando, I see that you're faithful and coming to church even though you work six days a week. I see that, oh, Jorge, you come to church even though you have to cross the border. I'm going to throw something your way, you know, just by chance. You wouldn't expect God to throw you a bone, but he does. Now let's cross-reference that verse to Proverbs 16, verse 9. Proverbs 16, verse 9. He's pondering your ways. Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. You know, God's will, sometimes we think of it like this mystical thing, like, God, reveal your will to me. When really, listen, you need to be, too often people try to focus on finding God's will by doing what they think they should be doing rather than doing what they know they should be doing. You know what you need to be doing right now? You need to be, you need to be able to live. You need to be providing for yourself. You know, can you, can you afford the basic things that you need in life? It's not, it's not carnal. You know, you need to live. God understands that. Are you doing what you know you should be doing? Am I trying to work? Am I trying to provide? Am I trying to make... Uh, get a, a, a an occupation here or there? Am I trying to read my Bible every day? These are things that you know are God's will. Before you rush out to try and do something that you don't even know if God wants you to do it, are you doing the things that you should be doing? Are you trying to go and start this mis- this uh, this ministry? Uh, I, I want to do a comic book ministry or I want to do a a, a, a a Yelp ministry where I go to restaurants and they give me free food and I, I take the food back to the church. That's you know, we, we have these carnal ideas of what we think God wants us to do. But before we get into that worldly way of thinking about the ministry, about what God's will is, let's do the things we know we need to be doing. You know you need to be at church every week. You know you need to be reading your Bible every day. You know you need, be, need to be trying to live holy, trying to live a sanctified Christian life. These are all things you know are God's will. To put your body under subjection, to pray for each other. Before you try and go and, and start something that you don't know if God's will is, do the things you know God's will is, and he'll guide your footsteps. He'll take you where you, and just by happenstance, by hap, 
He'll throw those little bones your way, and he'll put you in front of a Boaz, or he'll put you in front of a Ruth. Just do what you need to be doing. Now, getting onto the meat, the meat here, we're going to see Boaz. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Now, Boaz is a godly man. And as we found, he was a mighty, he's a mighty man and he's wealthy. And this brings me to uh, my first uh, meat point. And you probably have not heard this if you haven't been to a Bible-believing church. But Boaz is a picture or a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. What do you mean, Pastor? Hosea, Hosea chapter 12, verse 10. I want to show you a biblical uh, rule of interpretation. This is a biblical rule of interpretation. Hosea chapter 12, verse 10, the Bible says this. The Bible says, I have also spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. In that word similitude, it, it means it's something similar to it. it it's, he uses similitudes, he uses pictures or types to illustrate spiritual concepts. Boaz is a type of of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer. See, Boaz, you're going to find, is a mighty man, he's a godly man, he's a wealthy man. Jesus Christ is a godly, well, is, he is God, wealthy, mighty, and he is the kinsman Redeemer. He wants to redeem us. Understand? The word redeem means to buy back something. So you're going to find, as you read the, the book, that Boaz is a type of Jesus Christ. And it said here in verse 4 that he, is, uh, that he said, Lord bless thee, the Lord be with you. Uh, in verse 3, it, he, he owned the field. You know, Jesus Christ, by the way, is uh, the Lord of the harvest. I think that's Luke 17, verse 3. Let me turn there real quick. Luke 17, verse 3. If I get it wrong, I'm sorry. But Jesus Christ is the Lord of the harvest. No, I'm sorry. It, it, there's a verse that says, Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest send laborers. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the harvest. Now, in verse... Uh, let's go all the way to verse 8 to 9. Let's read up to there. Verse 4, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said, uh, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And he's looking at Ruth and he's saying, Who is this? You know, Ruth stuck out like a sore thumb. Like I pointed out, she wasn't from Israel, she wasn't from Judah or Israel. She was a Moabitess. She she was she was darker skinned, she looked different, she was a Gentile. Okay? You know what that means? That means that Ruth is a picture of the body of Christ, the Gentile bride. Now, moving forward, verse set, uh, six. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So, so Ruth had came up to these reapers. These guys were like harvesting, okay? And they were reaping. And there was a law in Israel, in, in the tribe of... There was a, lo a law for the Jews... That they had to leave some behind. Okay, this was God's welfare program. Where instead of taking all their harvest, they would leave some behind for people to glean. Meaning they would pick up the scraps to feed themselves if they couldn't make ends meet. See, God, he has his law for these people so that they don't starve to death. God's looking out for the little people too, the people that can't make ends meet. So Ruth had just come to them and said, listen, can you... Let me glean here. She wasn't looking for a handout. She wasn't looking for a welfare program where it's just gimme, gimme, gimme. She was trying to get to work. And it said here in verse uh, 7, And she said, I pray you let me glean gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. She, she was working all day. She was getting to work. She, wasn't, she was serious about it. She wasn't just trying to get handouts. Verse 
8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not my daughter? Go not to glean to, in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art a thirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Boaz is saying, listen, I want you here. You stay in this field. No one's going to touch you. No one's going to mess with you. If you're thirsty, you go to that well and you get waters. And Jesus Christ is the same with you. I don't want you anywhere else. You stay with me. I feed you. I'll give you water. I'll provide all your needs. And no one's going to mess with you. And Naomi did what she should have done. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? You know, we were all strangers once to Jesus Christ. You know, the reason a person goes to hell isn't because he's a bad person. It's because Jesus Christ doesn't know that person. You know, what is he going to tell a lost person in the great white throne judgment? He said, he's going to say, I never knew thee. A person goes to hell because they don't want to come to know Jesus Christ. And more importantly, Jesus Christ doesn't know them. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, how thou hast left, left thy father and thy mother and, thy, and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. You know what's interesting about this verse? Is that God, he, he looks more at your heart rather than he does at just the, the, the rules and the laws here. You know why? Because Boaz here... If you go to the Old Testament scripture, he's breaking the law. Go to Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. Ruth is a Moabitess. True? Is that correct? Well, here, let's look what the Bible says about the Moabites. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3. It says here, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. You see, God had put that rule in place because the Moabites were wicked people. And God, he wants his people separate from those people. So he said, even to their 10th generation. But God looks at the heart. I mean, if you recall David, when he was starving, he, he ate he ate from the, the, the uh, tabernacle when he shouldn't have. He wasn't a Levite, but God let it slide, you know, because God's reasonable. I'm not, I'm not justifying law, breaking the law, but God looks at a person's heart. Boaz looked at Ruth and looked at her heart and said, listen, I heard about what you did, who you left behind, that you went and claimed to your mother-in-law when you had no reason to. You know, that, that's, that's something you'd only do out of a pure heart. You wouldn't do that out of guilt. You wouldn't do that out of, uh, out of your own self-interest. And Ruth was an amazing daughter. And Boaz said to her, the Lord, verse 12, the Lord recompense thy work and a full reward be given of the, Lord, uh, of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, thou, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And she's saying, listen, I'm not like them. I'm different. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not one of you guys. But she was grateful that she that she would be taken in like that you know jesus christ had no reason to take you in jesus christ had no reason to save you you know we're wicked we're lost we didn't deserve salvation but jesus christ showed us grace and favor and he took us in why how can we have bible believing saved christians that don't have this kind of attitude towards god you know some of us think maybe some of you think i deserve to be saved if that's what you think Man, what a, what a, you got to get your heart right. Listen, God doesn't, you know what grace is? It's something we get we don't deserve. And Boaz said unto her, at mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers and he reached her parched corn and she did eat and was sufficed and left. You know, Jesus Christ, he'll feed you. He'll, he'll satisfy your needs. He, he's not just trying to starve you to death and, 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 help and send you to a war-torn country to get tortured and, for the name of Christ. You know, he takes care of you, doesn't he? Isn't there food in your fridge? I mean, listen, we've all had hard times, 
But hasn't there been a roof over your heads? Hasn't God dealt more than gracefully with you? And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. See, they were taken in. He took took, uh, Ruth in with no reason to, and he didn't have to. Now, Again, I said that Ruth is a type of the the church. She's a type of the body of Christ. You know, her first husband died. Okay? And Romans chapter 7, verse 1 to 4. Romans chapter 7, verse 1 to 4. I'm showing you how this illustrates these two people to be a type of Jesus Christ and the church. So you can understand the relationship God, Jesus Christ, wants to have with you. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. The Bible says... Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. And if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress. Though she be married to another man, wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should be bring forth fruit unto God. You see, before we were saved, we were brought under we were under the law. The law brought us under condemnation. The bro- the law pointed out that we were wicked sinners that couldn't be saved on our own accord, and we were married to that. But now that the law is dead because Jesus Christ, he fulfilled the law. Remember, the Bible says in John 1, 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now we're under grace. See, now we we're free to marry a new, a a new husbandman or a new husband. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And now that we could be married to Jesus Christ spiritually, the Bible says this in Deuteronomy 24, 1-4. You don't have to turn with me. I'll just read it for you. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it came to pa- come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. So this is about divorce. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and, and be another man's wife. So now this woman is free to find another, uh, another man to marry freely and if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorce but he giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house or if the latter husband die which took her to be his wife her former husband which sent her away may not take her again to be his wife see we're no longer back under we're not going back to the law amen we're not going through that tribulation okay we're not going to be offering those sacrifices um <clears throat> may not uh her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after that she is de- defiled, for that is abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So we're, we have a stronger uh, marriage now because we don't go back to that old man. We don't go back to the law. We're under grace. We're eternally secure. So that's what we see here with, with uh, Boaz and Ruth as we were going to read on. Uh, Going forward, I want to get moving. Verse 16. And let let her glean, verse 15, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not and let some... Let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So so Boaz is throwing her a bone. She's like, he's telling his men, all right, when you see Ruth, when you're, let, when you're letting them glean, throw a couple more her way. See, he's taking care of her. And that's what God does with you. Sometimes you feel like, I'm tired, I'm laboring, I just, I'm done with this. Uh, and you feel like it's just getting so much on you. But then every now and again, God will just send you a couple handfuls of purpose. Keep going, keep going. Don't give up, all right? Ruth was out there doing hard labor. I mean, how many of you have had to work 12 hours in the scorching hot sun before? You know, you do it every day, brother. Um, But God will send you a handful of purpose just to keep you going. You know, he's he's looking out for you. And Boaz was looking out for Ruth. 
So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned, and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Wherest thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. She's like, someone threw you a bone. Oh, bless this man. Who could this, this amazing man be? Who, who is this guy? And then it says right here, and she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, blessed be he of the Lord who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, the man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. So they were like relatives, okay? And the, in the law, a relative, uh, when, when a person, when a man dies and leaves a wife behind and, and property and all this stuff, the law tells you that whoever's the next of kin, whoever is the closest in relationship to that man is to take that wife, is to take that property and raise it up to, to keep the man's name uh, uh I, I might have difficulty explaining that to you, but it, it was basically he was under the law to to pr provide for them. So she's saying Boaz is related to me. He's next of kin. You can marry him. Verse 21, and Ruth the Moabite said, he said unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. She's saying, Boaz probably likes you. You got to stay there. Don't leave the field. Christians, don't leave the field. Jesus Christ loves you. And one day, one day, listen, our salvation is not complete, but he's going to redeem our bodies. And one day we'll be at that wedding supper of the Lamb. But moving forward, verse 22, so she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to clean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with their mother-in-law. So some time passed by. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1, okay? Chapter 3, I'm going to try and get clo uh, move quicker. So the next part is the kinsman redeemer. And Naomi has a plan to get Ruth a man, a good man. Ladies, you need to find yourselves a good man, not some, some wicked man that's going to treat you awful, that doesn't even care about your mother-in-law, okay? Or care about your mother. So it said here in verse 1, Then Naomi, her, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? So Naomi's about to seek rest for, for Ruth. Wash thyself. I'm sorry, verse 2. And now, now is not Boaz of our kindred with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore and anoint thee and put thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the men until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet. And lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. So Naomi comes up with the plan to get Ruth married to, to Boaz. Now, and that's what a good mother should want for her daughter, for her children, is for them to find a good man, a good wife. You know, and I know that not everyone's going to get married, and, some, and sometimes God doesn't, you know, God has other plans in store for you. But, there, but marriage is a good thing. And uh, this flies in the face of modern society. They hate the idea of God having an ordained family structure. I mean, listen, don't you, you should love your mother and your father. And that's how God intended it. You know, there's three ordinances that God has instituted. There's three institutions, I should say, that God has laid place for, for man to follow. One is the government. Well, I'll start in the, in the correct order. One is the local church. All right. That should go. That they didn't go nowhere. God has instituted that. The local church is a is a core institute of society. And when the local churches start to flounder, guess what? Society's going with it. The next thing is is the government. All right, we're to put ourselves under the government. We're to put ourselves under rule. We're supposed to follow the law to the best of our ability. And I get it. Some of you probably run yellow lights. Get under the blood. But the ne the the last and one of the most important is the family. See, revival starts in the home. Revival starts at the dinner table. Revival starts uh, reading your Bible to your, to your children. That's where revival starts. 
See, and the church, you know, I can't follow you in your homes and see if you're living godly lives, teaching your children or your family about the Bible. That, that's between you and God. But the modern society hates this structure. You know, they want to attack it. They want to say that, you know, as long as, as, long as, it's, a, as it's a family unit. Well, listen, a family is a, mo- a father, a mother, and a child. That's what it is. That's what God intended. Now, Naomi wants Boaz to redeem Elimelech's assets. And I already explained to you that Old Testament law that, they, that the next of kin was to redeem that. You know, we're, we're redeemed by Jesus Christ, by the way. So the next thing I want to bring to your attention, by the way, is that Naomi's plan is a little risque. And Hollywood and, and, and people with wicked minds will look at this and think dirty thoughts and think, oh, well, Ruth is, is uh, Naomi's putting Ruth to try and prostitute herself. That's not what's happening, okay? Ruth is trying to come and see, listen, I want to be your wife, okay? That's the idea here. It's not something dirty. So they're pure. You're going to see here, verse 5, it says, And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And she set, went down unto the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. Women, that's an important lesson to learn too. Is men, sometimes, and this is a practical thing, sometimes you got to catch a man at the right time. You gotta, if, you want, if you want something done, you got to wait till your husband's in a good mood, don't you? If you want something to get done at the house, don't you got to wait until, you know, your husband is, is, is unwinding after he got home from work? You don't just come up to them and put everything on them when they get home from work, do you? You know, that's the, that's the surefire way of starting an argument. You know, whoever is right and wrong, that's between you and your husband or, or your wife. But this was sound advice. And, and Naomi told Ruth, listen, when, when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn and she came softly, softly, and uncovered his feet and laid her down, okay? So she laid down at his feet. And I'm not telling you ladies you have to do that, okay? Some of you would probably kill your husband for you before you did that. <laughs> yeah, you're looking at me like, no, it's not going to happen. Um, verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 8, and it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid. He's saying, who's that? And turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet, and he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. See, Boaz, uh, a type of Christ, looking at, it's pure, it's not, it's not dirty. So, what happens? And he said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, uh, thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed me showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. You see, after you got saved, uh, it would be better if you had just followed Jesus Christ instead of going back to your idols, going to another, finding another man, you know. Verse 11, And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou request, requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. All right, and this is why Ruth is a virtuous woman. Go to, give me a second. Go to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31. Every, every woman should know this passage. Every woman should know this passage. Proverbs 31 verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? And compare that with Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 4. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is, rot- is his rottenness and his bones. You know, a virtuous woman is something to be treasured, you know, like rubies. A, vir- a good woman is someone that you should treasure. Don't take her for granted. Don't take- if you have a good woman in your life, you know, uh, if you have a good mother, a good daughter, a good sister, a good wife, t- don't take her for granted. She's virtuous. She- if she has virtue, if she's virtuous, she's valuable. And Jesus Christ sees the church as valuable, okay? And listen, Ruth was virtuous because she decided, she made a decision to stick it out with Naomi when it didn't benefit her in the body, when it didn't benefit her in her self-interest. She put her interest aside and decided to go uh, 
in favor of someone else. That's charity. Okay? And I want to push you to make a decision. As, as we keep reading, I want you to put yourself in, Naomi, in Ruth's shoes. Are you willing to just put your own will aside and let God deal with it, deal with your problems? You know, it seems like things are starting to work out for Ruth. And as we read, it says here in verse 19, I'm sorry, in verse 12, and now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. So he's saying, listen, there's a kinsman that has first dibs. I, w- I-, I want to take you as my wife, but first I got to make sure I'm going to follow the law. I'm going to do what I need to do. But he says, tarry this night. And it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But, so he's saying, if he, if he wants to take you, okay, well, there's nothing I can do about it. But, if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee. As the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. So they, they were pure, okay? He didn't just take her to, to wife quite yet. And by the way, marriage is flesh joining flesh. It's not just a ceremony, okay? A ceremony is good, okay? There's a wedding ceremony, and the, the wedding supper, the lamb, all that. But marriage first is flesh joining flesh. So they, they didn't get married that night. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. Knowing, okay? That's, that's biblical marriage, intercourse. Okay, and she rose up before one could know another. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Now he's worried about her testimony. He said, listen, if someone saw what ha- you leaving, they'd think the wrong thing and think something happened that didn't. Men, women, you need to be very careful about your testimony, how you interact with, the, with a woman or a man, okay? It could be pure. You could be, you know, a friendly handshake here and there. But if it looks wrong to the wrong person, that could ruin your testimony. You better, you better be careful, Okay, now verse uh, 14 and she, I'm sorry, verse 15. And he said, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her. And she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, who art thou, my daughter? She's asking, who art thou? Are you Mrs. Are you Miss Ruth or Mrs. Boaz? Who are you? Do I call you by a new name now? See, nothing happened. And when she, and she said, these six measures of barley, I'm sorry, verse 16, and she told her all that the man had done unto her, or done to her. And she said, these six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. See, he was thinking about the, Naomi too. He wasn't just looking at Ruth like a, like a, like a, like a, like a dog would. See, he cared about the family. He cared about Naomi too. And that's what you want in a good man, ladies. You want a man that cares about the family, that wants to provide and, and cares just more than about you. And then she said, sit still, my daughter, until thou know the matter will, how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. So Naomi was assured, no, this man is a real deal. He's a character. He has strong virtue as well. Verse chapter four, verse one. All right, last chapter, and I'll get through it. Is the kinsman redeemer? Is uh, the kinsman is redeemed? The kinsman is redeemed. Now Boaz is going to try and buy back Elimelech's stuff, but first the the near kinsman. He has to go to him first. So okay, we're on types now. Boaz is a type of what? It's a type of Jesus Christ. All right, Ruth is a type of what? So if we're going to go through this typology, these similitudes, these pictures, what would this near kinsman be? No. No. Well, let's go further. So then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one. You know, he's trying to get buddy-buddy with this guy. All right. Turn aside. And sit down here, and he turned aside and sat down. So Boaz is going to try, and he has a plan to redeem Ruth because he wants to marry her. He wants to marry Ruth. And this near kinsman has first dibs, all right? But he wants to marry Ruth, this Gentile woman. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down, and he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that has come out of the country of Moab, selleth the parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech. So he's saying, listen, 
Naomi, you know Naomi, right? 10 years ago, she left, all that stuff. And, you know, terrible tragedy happened. We sent our condolences. But she's back. And Elimelech's dead. And she has this property. So he, he's, he's mentioning Naomi. He's mentioning the property. And he said under the kinsman, Naomi, this is that has come up out of the country myself, a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me them, that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee. And I am after thee. And he said it. And he said, I will redeem it. So, so let's get the picture here. So. Boaz gets this near kinsman, okay? This near kinsman. He says, listen, you got first dibs here. Naomi's back, and this, par this parcel of land is up for grabs, and you get first bit. Uh, do you want to redeem it? Notice how he doesn't mention Ruth. Okay? That's important. He's painting that. He, he's, he's offering this to him. Saying, look, we got, Naomi, we got Naomi. We got this property. You want to redeem it? Yeah, I'll redeem it. Yeah. Hey, I wasn't expecting that. Hey, that's happy day. That's a great thing. Verse 5. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of, the, of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. Oh, yeah. And by the way, you got to marry Ruth. Whoa, whoa, whoa. One wife's enough. Okay. The near kinsman is a picture of God the Father. He's a picture of God the Father. Isn't God already married to Israel? And he divorced, I know that, but he's going to marry, marry her back. But God had first dibs, but Jesus Christ, he, he redeemed the church. See? Verse 6. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. See, he's not trying to get it... Mix it, mix and match here, okay? And, and God the Father has a special relationship with Israel, but Jesus Christ has a special relationship with the church. Remember, God's a trinity. You know, they're three separate persons, but they're one God. Now, this was the manner in former times. So we can skip this um, all the way to verse 9. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's and the ha of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his uh, place. Ye are witnesses this day. So Boab, he, Boaz, he makes the purchase. And he paid the price. And you know who paid the price for you? Is Jesus Christ. In the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We're almost done here. The book of Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says here. In verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. God purchased you. He redeemed you. You're no longer your own. He purchased you and redeemed you from the curse of the law. And he paid the price. And now what? Now what's in store? Listen, it's a happy, happily ever after. You know, we live in a time where people don't like happy endings anymore. Isn't that true? Like they always want some like dark ending or twist ending or something. God's not like that. You know, it's a happy ending. Verse 11 and all the people that were in the gate and the elders said we are witnesses the lord make the woman that has come into thine house like rachel and like leah which too did build the house of israel and do thou worthily in aparta and be famous in bethlehem you see israel took them in Is israel took ruth in you know she <coughs> she was a moabitess you know they had no reason to accept her <coughs> the law actually condemned the moabites but they said, let her be like Leah and like, and like uh, Rachel. You know, they took her in when before she was a, a lost, a world, uh, I'm sorry, a foreign woman in the Bible. You know, a Moabitess, a Philistine woman. Uh, they're a picture of a lost person, a lost woman. But they took her in once she was redeemed. And you know what, Christians? You need to be able to take those Christians in once they've been saved. You need to look past who they were. Look past who you were. You're no longer, you know, 
Miss, Miss Naomi or Miss Ruth. You're now Mrs. Boaz. You know, you're now married to, the, to Jesus Christ. You're a different person. Verse 12, and let, thy, and let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh's, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name be famous in Israel. You see, even and Naomi got a happily ever after too. You know, God... He brought her back to the house of bread and praise, and then tragedies happen. But you know what? That that mother and daughter duo, they they got, they made out. You know, they stuck together, and you need to stick together with your family, with your Christian brethren, and just stick it out. Verse fifteen, and he shall be unto thee. I'm sorry. Yes, verse 15. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. Have you called your grandmas today? It's Mother's Day. And the woman, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. You see, this, this, this happenstance, this just chance occurrence, this tied directly into the kingly line of Jesus Christ, the genealogy, see? And they had no idea what, was, what their seed was going to bring forth. And I'm just hoping that that you could have gotten something from this. If you're maybe you're afar off right now. If you're watching online, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you don't know if you're saved. Maybe you're not 100% sure, but it's important for us to be 100% sure because once we were dead from sin, now let me take you to Ephesians 2:19 and that'll be our last verse. Ephesians 2:19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You're no longer a stranger to Jesus Christ. If you're saved, he knows you. And guess what? There's nothing that can separate you from him. But if you're not saved, if you don't know, if you have not been regenerated, if you're not 100% sure that you're going to heaven, you've got to make sure. You know, you can't act. You're, you, there's no accident here, okay? You don't just accidentally get saved. You make a conscious decision a, a choice to believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's only one sin that God can't forgive. It's rejecting his son. And if you want to just become a part of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, all you need to do is just come to him and say, God, my father, I believe on your son, Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins and that he paid for them and that I deserve a sinner's rotten, dirt, burning hell, but he died for me and paid the price, and rose again the third day. If you tell him that, and believe on that, and confess and call upon Jesus' name, you will be saved. But for you Bible-believing Christians, I pray that you could be encouraged by this message. I pray that you won't take your mothers, or your sisters, or your, or your daughters, or your grandmothers, or aunts, or whoever for granted. A virtuous woman is valuable, and you're, you're to take care of them. You're to provide for them. You're to treat them with respect and not just like how most men do nowadays.